Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Alchemy Lab. My name is Matt. I'll be your alchemist this evening, and I'm joined by author Amy Sutfin. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. It's a great pleasure. Um, so for people who don't know who you are, who are you and what do you do? So I am an independent author. I write and self-publish uh, fantasy and sci-fi. Uh, I have three sci or sorry, fantasy novels uh, out there in the world, uh, the Twisted Realm series. Uh, so I just got all three of them out on paperback. The first one has been out on paperback. It was kind of a little experiment to see how that would work and it went really well. So I decided to get all three of them out there. Uh, I also have a sci-fi novel that's um, slowly coming out on Kindle Vela. Hmm, okay, right. So these three, the, so this series here, this is the fantasy series. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay, and that is the Twisted Realms, the Twisted Realm series, rather. Yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, so let's start there. So, with your, with the Twisted Realm series, what is the kind of, what's the idea behind it? What's, what's happening in it? What's the, what's the concept? Uh, so it is a young adult fantasy series, so magic and adventure. Okay. Um, for ages and probably 13 and up. Uh, it is a world where magic is not very well understood. Um, it is also very dangerous in and of itself. Uh, it's um, kind of the, the concept that I wanted to do was like, what if magic was kind of like radiation and the way mm. most people yeah understand radiation is it's uh, it's scary um you don't know where it is you don't know what it's doing but you know it'll mess you up so that's kind right. of the idea i went with um and some people have magic they don't really know how they get it uh and some other people who don't have magic or maybe they do have magic uh, are still afraid of it and uh, afraid of people who have it. So we start with uh, Amaya, who tragically, in pure young adult fiction, has just lost her parents. Um, yeah, she's at their funeral, and it's not a very good time for her. Uh, and then as you read the book, you find out that uh, she's, not, she's not popular <laughs> in her village. And mm. She's very much um, sort of a pariah, but she has to exist there. And so she, uh, it kind of starts out, doesn't exactly explain why, um, because in her head, she, she would never say it out loud. She wouldn't put that into the world to say, oh, I have magic. And eventually it does get dragged out of her. She's like, yeah, I've got magic, like a, like a disease. It's kind of like a disease to her. And so what happens is uh, these barbarians, for lack of a better term, or how they would be perceived to someone, especially, you know, a girl about 15 or 16, come into the village and take over. And it makes no sense to her or probably to anyone else. Uh, but I was going to say, I'm glad you added to her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it makes uh, no yeah. sense, but I wrote it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it, it makes sense to, uh, to these, um, power hungry, just men who want to come in and wreak havoc. Mm. Um, you know, it's kind of like, if you've ever imagined, you know, you're just sitting around letting, uh, letting your thoughts wander and you're like, what if I just took over the city and made all the rules I wanted and, got rid of all the stop signs and stop lights and it was pure chaos. You know, that was mm. kind of, kind of how it feels for mm. her and um, probably not that far out of uh, uh, their own thoughts, you know, so it, it's fun basically for them. Mm. Uh, but they do have, they do have intentions. They didn't, you know, necessarily just come in 
to take over. Uh, they have something they want, and Amaya does figure that out hmm. uh, almost possibly when it's too late. And uh, I think readers could judge maybe it was too late. Maybe she should have figured it out sooner, but again, she's a mm. kid, so not much she can do. Okay. And yep, so she has to, uh, well, she gets a little break. Uh, the They call themselves the kings. They decided they want to be kings. That was a kind of another thought, like, what if I was just the king? And uh, they... They figure out that she has magic. She strange things are happening. She knows. She knows she's doing it, but she's not going to say anything. And uh, someone kind of spills the beans to them. Someone in the village. Um, mm. And so they're like, "You have magic." And she's like, "Yeah." <laughs> and they go, "Hey, your life is kind of terrible. We'll uh, we'll make you our apprentice. We'll teach you how to use your magic. It's going to be great." And uh, all the red flags are there, of course, but why would she say no? Mm. So she goes and learns magic from them, um, and everything's great, except there's uh, some young man that they're holding captive for some reason. And mm. that, that should have uh, kind of tipped her off, but eventually uh, he does tip her off, and she doesn't want to believe it. So... I don't want to spoil the whole thing, but yeah, yeah, okay. Basically, yeah. All right. So she's she's being taught magic essentially by the villains. Of yeah. The... Mm, interesting. Okay, it's interesting that approach that approach to like they've invaded, but she doesn't understand why. I imagine that's basically how it would go. Yeah. Even to someone who's not a kid, just someone who's not. Yeah. plugged into current affairs they'd be like okay well uh, these people are here uh, I guess I've got to try and live my life but yeah uh, that is basically how it goes um, life goes on uh, the people are terrified of them and they come up with you know some crazy decrees and they're volatile and no one knows what they're going to do but if you just stay out of their way you know, you might be okay. So that's kind of the attitude, and um, which maybe tells you a little bit about what she's dealing with uh, before they arrive. Mm. Uh, so she definitely, she goes, um, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire, possibly, or... Yeah. Yeah. She seems to be starting off pretty, quite vulnerable, and then... Yeah. Well, she and then she gets into a situation that's even more... And volatile than it could be oh yeah um and it it does it it does get worse um she she kind of realizes like she starts she knows they're bad everyone does and she starts to uh see it and then one day she does um she sees what they're really doing and uh it involves this poor guy and sh she could be next mm, okay so then it kind of, um, I guess, that's that's where it begins. And then she, uh, I don't know how much you want me to. Uh, uh, well, don't spoil your own stuff. Don't do what don't do what Ian Patrick did and spoil her entire book and mine. Oh, just okay. just to, just go as far. As, I think that's that's probably that's a good teaser. There. And that's this is all the first book, I'm guessing. Yes. All right. So you said so you, the, your approach to magic there is interesting. So it's so it's like radiation. So it's it's very very damaging, I'm guessing. So it's it can kill yeah. you, I guess, if you're using it. Um, it could definitely kill you. Uh, I do try to. I don't go too much into that because this is young adult. Um, right. but yeah, it essentially it could kill you um and either just from being around it the wrong kind of magic um there are kind of different types of magic there's um hmm. magic that's kind of contained and that stuff's not so dangerous and then there's magic that i call raw magic that's just out in the world um and that gets released uh among other things by doing magic so it's like you know you uh, 
oh, I don't know, you you burn you burn something and then the heat goes out. Kind of mm, like that. okay. Yeah. So uh, so pe can people like influence that stuff that's naturally in the world and then kind of bring it out? Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, that's uh might be a little that might be explained in the books. If not very well, these first three then uh, later. But it is an issue. It is something they consider. Um, they definitely, it's, it is kind of like, oh, it would be great if we could get this stuff and just put it back in the container and use it the way we use normal magic, but they kind of can't. Um, hmm. So yeah, that's bad stuff. And then there's what they would call uh, rotten magic, which is just magic that's doing something really, really bad. I don't go too much into that yet, maybe later on, um, but it's, that's kind of your three types of magic in the story. And so uh, rotten magic is like just destroying stuff or, um, you know, just gone completely wrong. Nobody knows what's going, what's going on. You just got to kind of get rid of it or hope it goes away. Okay. So where, where did that system come from? Because that's a, I'm always curious about how people do, how people particularly who write fantasy deal with magic and how, because it's it's what it's almost like a I don't know about a trope, but it's 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 sort of omnipresent in a lot of fantasy, and how people yeah. approach it is always something that is interesting to me because it can be approached in a way that like breaks the story. Yeah. Um. Well, it it kind of just evolved as I wrote it. It definitely. Uh, in some ways fulfilled a need uh, for the story and in other ways it was like you know I was writing I'm like oh you know I've been talking about magic and oh this thing over here happened and it's really bad maybe there's a term for that maybe they have a term for that mm. um, so yeah a lot of it just kind of uh, came from uh, you know, the story itself as I was writing. So I don't really, besides the radiation thing, I don't really have much besides, um, I was like, what if this happened? Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think it is, people do, uh, they, they think about the magic systems a lot. And I wanted to, like, I wasn't going to have a hard magic system, mm. to use the phrase. Um, it Maybe it's hard in some respects, but uh, it, it was too much. It wasn't um, really what the story was about. Magic is part of the story and it causes a lot of conflict and the characters use it. Mm. But to me, the story is about the characters and their journey and their um, triumphs and um, stuff like that. So, mm. you know, I didn't, uh, in that particular story, isn't centered on like explaining how this magic works exactly and even um i so i kind of incorporated into the story that the characters don't even really know and in fact um i guess part of it came from uh my the sciencey side of my brain uh right which is like uh you know we attempt to categorize and understand things and we do the best we can but it doesn't always um it doesn't always fit the what it actually is so I do even break down the uh, understanding of the different kinds of magic which is like not like the the raw and the rotten and the normal but more like how they would categorize it so they're like oh magic that has to do with um, building things that's constructive magic and magic that has to do with plants that's natural magic mm -hmm. uh, so the structure of the system is uh, kind of how a person would categorize it and understand it. And even in the books, they're, uh, they're doing research on magic. So one of the characters, uh, that's part of his deal, is he's um, kind of smart and he's really good at magic and he just kind of understands it. And uh, that's what he's doing, he's researching it. So, and that is kind of, kind of part of the story is, you know, 
this stuff is causing a problem and they need to understand it better in order to solve the problems. Hmm. Okay. It's, it's something that, yeah, I think I had a similar kind of approach where it wasn't a, in, in my work, it's not a, like a hard magic system, really. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, there's elements to it. There are some limits on it. Um, but you can do basically, you can do basically anything in terms of like lifting and yeah. shooting fire and bringing people to life. You can do that kind of thing. The limits are on it are time and the amount of energy it takes. So if you wanted to bring someone back to life, it would take decades upon decades and lots and lots of power yeah. to do it. Um, whereas if you wanted to shoot a fireball, it would take less. It would just be... Um, yeah, that's... Uh, I mean, that's... That sounds like a, a solid system. Yeah, and if you, use too, to if you use too much of it, it kind of, exo it kind of burns you up. Yeah, yeah. As well. Um, and... So it's like two hard limits. There's two hard limits there, really. You can't use too much at once, and you can't... You can do anything in theory, but you can't do anything in practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of, I kind of have a similar rule, but it 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 gets maybe bent over time. Um, when Amaya is first learning magic, you know, they're like, "Oh, lift this chair." She's like, "I can't do it," and mm. uh, they're like, "Well, it's you know, right now you can't, you know, you're not even strong enough to." lift something that you can't lift on your own but eventually the more you practice your magic's going to increase in strength uh greater than even your normal physical strength so mm. you know you you definitely uh you gotta have some explanations for some things you can't just uh as a writer i think if you want your system to be taken somewhat seriously you, you gotta have some rules so try to do that Hmm. Okay, so you you're three books in to the Twisted Realms mm -hmm. series. I've yet to read them for boring life reasons that are I won't get I, they're genuinely boring and I won't get into them because they're so damn boring. There's <laughs> nothing dramatic, it is just sheer boring. Yeah. Um if they were interesting, you know, you could be like, Oh, I can't read yeah. because this is happening. Yeah, exactly yeah if they were interesting i'd say but they're not interesting so i won't um but i i am they're on my list of things to pick up normally i try and read at least some of someone's work before i interview them um that's okay but, i think uh, i hope i explained it so yeah well i mean you've you've got me interested <laughs> so so there is that i like the concept definitely i'm curious about these villains as well i like a good villain so what about these villains how okay so how much can you say actually um without i can spoiling? say quite a bit i i will say um i don't know if it'll disappoint people to hear but uh they kind of disappear for a little while um they are defeated uh okay. at some point in the first book uh and then maybe they become a problem again um, hmm. so they are, um, they're not like other mages. And I think there is, uh, maybe some indication of that, which becomes clear later on that they are, you know, the rest of the mages in the world would not do what they do. And um, some of the things that they had, um, you know, a normal per a normal mage wouldn't wouldn't get involved with, wouldn't touch, and certainly wouldn't use. So, um, hmm. well, uh, they they, they kind of have a, a, a magical object that uh, is very sketchy. <laughs> so hmm, okay, um, and then they uh, also would. Um, they would 
use any means to get magic and power. So that's kind of how they are. And they're also, you know, they're kind of violent and brutal, um, but they're also, you know, they can be persuasive and even nice. And it's interesting because Amaya sees them doing both. And um, they're definitely the kind of villains that make a person like her go, I don't care what they're doing is bad. I'm going to keep, I'm going to go along with them anyway. So uh, some someone like that who really got some power and got a following uh, could be a very serious villain mm. down the road. Um, but they're charming enough to get that. Well, I mean, they they're charming enough to get followers. Otherwise, yeah. no one would follow them, and they wouldn't gain any more power. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, charming. Uh, they could be. They can be charming. They can be persuasive, but they also would have the allure of power. So they would, mm. you know, attract the worst kind of followers, the kind who also didn't care what they did mm. um, to get what they want. And so, this is um, this is kind of an issue with magic that you find out through the story from, you know, like a thousand years ago in the world was people who used magic to get power. And actually uh, the Twisted Realm uh, is a place that kind of saw the, uh, uh, the, the worst of that, that there were um, uh, sorcerers, I guess. Uh, I kind of reserved that phrase for like the worst ma mage magic users, um, most powerful as well. Sorcerers who, that's what they were doing, they were, um, you know, getting using magic to get power and more magic and taking over the world and basically um, just destroying everything. And then the Twisted Realm is this place that's kind of been, um, you know, blocked off with magical barriers and contained because it is a uh, world of um, just uh, a, a scarred, twisted landscape from these magical battles and from these experiments with magic um, that, you know, that almost destroyed all of the world and actually kind of pretty thoroughly destroyed all of the mages at one point. And that's not really a spoiler. Um, mm. Yeah, so... Uh, Lots of lore, I like it. Yeah, it's... um, But it through the story and especially you can see through uh, these villains and their names are, might as well, if I can remember that, uh, Azo or Azo, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and Gabek Fen, hyphen, uh, there's a hyphen in there somewhere. Um, that's kind of who they are. They're, they're this, uh, this kind of person who who would do this, who would just destroy the world and enslave everyone if they could. Mm. Uh, but they don't have that much power just yet. Mm. Or maybe they never will. Mm. Who's, to Who's to say? Who's to say? Well, this is the thing with villains that is so... <clears throat> they can be quite tricky to write. I imagine yeah. it can be... I imagine in YA it, it can be even trickier to write. It's There's that balance of their they're bad and you've got to you and they're well, they're bad and they're powerful but they have to be beatable but not too beatable because you want there to be tension when they show up yeah. and you want them to not be you want them to not be a pushover and i feel like yeah. that's a it can be a real issue in ya when yeah. you have the the villain getting pants every week it's like uh yeah. The, the two the, like there's two approaches to it i guess like um there's like the animorphs approach and the harry potter approach so animorphs had i don't know if you've ever read animorphs i don't think so it's i think because we mentioned molly b earlier i think it, that's made it pop that's pop it's popped into my head because i talked about it with her that's like a, a YA series. Well, I say a YA. It's like probably like early teen series, really, about a bunch of, of teenagers who can turn into animals and they fight aliens. And yeah. the aliens, the the head alien guy, 
who's like the general who's invading Earth, his he shows up in probably every book and gets beaten in every book, which is sort of a problem because yeah. you know the tension kind of whenever he shows up it's a bit like okay well this guy's here because he's always here it's not like oh no he's here yeah whereas uh, in harry potter you've got like the overarching threat of someone like of, of voldemort yeah and he's not defeated when he shows up every time in fact the first time he shows up he pretty resoundingly wins I think. Yeah. It's been a while since I've read them, slash seen the movies. But he kills that guy and he comes back to life and he's got all his guy, all his dementors with him. No, not dementors. Death eaters. Death eaters. Yeah. They they yeah. they show up probably as well. They show up later and before. Yeah. Uh well I I would uh think of the kind of the Harry Potter villain as like he's soundly defeated maybe officially defeated at the very end but they like mm. they fight him but they don't ever kill him and mm. uh so he's just the constant um threat so uh yeah that probably um that's probably a uh you know especially the re reoccurring villain that's a you know something you think oh i can do this better i'm gonna do it better because i just love this villain and he's so mm. great I'm going to keep bringing them back and yeah. uh, they're going to thwart them every time. And <laughs> I, I wonder if uh, part of it is, you know, they want you to think their main characters are strong and capable, but also not too strong and capable. So it's like, well, mm. they defeated him, but look, he came back. They're, they're mm. not that great. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the line between defeated and defeated for now. Yeah, yeah. I think like they got that they got that right in Harry Potter. It's like the def yeah, you you kind of pushed him back for now, but he's yeah. doing a bunch of stuff in the background and ramping it up. So with every story it gets a, a little bit darker. I think it's a difference between cuz Harry Potter was seven books, seven yeah. books. It's yeah. a difference between seven books and 54, which is Animorphs. Yeah. And they're kind of pitched a little bit differently. I think Harry Potter, they kind of pitch that low they, in terms of age. They pitch it kind of low first and then it gets a bit more. Yeah. Whereas um, Animorphs, it never really, it never really matured. It just stayed at its sort of baseline. Well, maybe matured a little bit. It got very weird and kind of messed up toward the end. Yeah. Uh, I do, I do admire the Harry Potter books quite a bit for multiple reasons, but I do like how um, they, you kind of grow, I got to grow up with Harry Potter, basically. I think we read the first book, my mom read it to me um, when I was eight. Not that I couldn't read, but, <laughs> um, and uh, it was so exciting. I, it was one of, one of the first books that, like, I think, really got me into storytelling not just reading but like appreciating stories um and then it was funny years later i tried to reread the first book i'm like this is terrible this is so like <laughs> lower grade right. and um i appreciate it i appreciate it a lot more now because i know how hard it is to write a book mm. um but it was interesting because uh oh i wish i could remember the year the last one came out and i i think i was older than Harry Potter by then so I was like I started out younger and then mm. I was maybe older when it came out I don't remember I might not have been um but it I was, was like I was in secondary school I was in high school when it when the last one came out I can't yeah remember that sounds right yeah I yeah. might have been about 16 maybe or 17 when it came yeah. out um but it was it was uh because it, it did increase in um level you know and it, it did grow with the readers, you know, by, uh, you know, 17, I was right, like thinking exactly the same way Harry thought. Uh, he, um, it was, it was funny because I, I've read, reread it since. Um, mm. And at that, at that age, I was like, yeah, you're, you know, you're 17, you're out here doing this crazy stuff. 
why was Dumbledore, you know, acting like a 17 year old, which I now understand uh, <laughs> when he was a kid. And mm. uh, then I reread it. I'm like, no, Harry, you're just a baby. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's... that was, uh, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny how much it's uh, just, I mean, those books, those books get a lot of flack now, mainly because yeah. of JK Rowling, but it's, yeah. and whether you, whether you think that's fair or not and wherever wh whether a listener thinks that's fair or not it's, it's sort of undeniable that those books shaped reading for a lot of people yeah. they certainly shaped reading for me like i was i think i went from well them and actually animorphs did i think them and i think those books i started on them and then i went to things like lord of the rings mm -hmm. which was a different experience entirely yeah. i think i had to I couldn't read the first book. I was I was too young for it. I think I was like when I tried to read it, I must have been ten or eleven or something like that. And it was just like, uh, why am I I can't I'm just gonna have to put this down. Watch the first movie and then went, Okay, I'm gonna read this again. Um now I know what's going on, I'm gonna try again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And read through it and read through the rest of them. And yeah. then moved on to things like Stephen King, and then since then it's been, it's been well as much as I can really. But yeah, I um, I do love Lord of the Rings. I love um, I love Peter Jackson's movies. Obviously, I'm starting to think I should probably watch the old cartoon. Uh, hmm. I haven't gotten around to that, and I think it's on some streaming site. Um, but I do, if you follow my Minds account, I post a lot of Lord of the Rings memes. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the bird, but she's... Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's excited. Try me in. Yeah. Try me in. What do you mean you haven't watched the cartoon? I've watched the cartoon. I just, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I haven't. The, uh, the 1971, I haven't watched it. And yeah. um, it's, it's, So that's the one, that's the Ralph, Ralph Bakshi? Is, that, is it that one? I don't know. That... I don't know anything about it. Like I, the the Lord of the Rings movies, what they came out. The first one was out in two thousand and one, which is nuts. Mm. I was, I don't know how. I was like nine or ten, giving mm. away my age. Not that it matters, but um, <laughs> yeah. So I just kind of got all consumed by that, and at that age, I was like, I don't want to watch no old cartoon, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, I, it was so the the cartoon. I think I haven't seen the cartoon either, and. I know that they did. He didn't make all of it. I think it only got. You know, it was only like the first book and like halfway through Two Towers or something like that. And that's kept yeah. me away. So I'm like, well, if you're not finishing this story, then yeah, yeah. it might be cute. Uh, I'll tr I'll give it a shot. Yeah, um, well, it's but, got some yeah. good voices. It's got. I think John Hurt's one of the. I think John Hurt's Aragorn or oh, Bilbo. Okay. Frodo really? yeah um but it's like rotoscoped and it's like it's it looks really it looks really trippy <laughs> hmm. um uh, you know I only I, I think I only know John Hurt from like Doctor Who but I feel like he's been in other stuff I know him so hmm. like I was in I was a Whovian for a while and um <laughs> yeah I'm not ashamed was, was being the optimum so. word <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. Um, actually, you know, the reason I stopped watching it um, was because it was on Netflix and Netflix was the only streaming site we had and they took it off. And I was like, I'm not paying to, you know, try and wa keep watching the show. I would have given mm. it a chance, but and then I just kind of got out of it. So who's your doctor? Uh, uh, David Tennant. <laughs> Love David Tennant. Yeah. Um, I didn't like, I think nobody liked, uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, Chris Eck Eccleston? I don't Eccleston. Know. Yeah, I liked okay. him. You I know, liked him. Uh, I he's... think a lot of people didn't like him, and that's why he only got one season, and I was like, ah, oh, he's all right. But then I went back, and I'm like, this guy is great. Why didn't they have him in more? He, uh, I think people on the set didn't like him. <laughs> I think that's why he only got one season. Yeah. He, um, yeah, there's there's a bunch of stuff about him being difficult but oh, okay. his i really like his i really like his stories a lot he's got a lot of really excellent stories and i like the way he played the character i'm yeah. i like matt smith 
I'm unashamedly like Matt. Matt Smith, a Matt Smith fan. Yeah, I mean, he's really good too. It's hard picking between him and uh, David Tennant, but I think David Tennant really got me into the show. So, mm. my doctor. Yeah. 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 Think, yeah. And I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't know, unpopular opinion, but um, uh, Donna is the best companion. <laughs> yeah, she surprised me. She's because Catherine Tate is is like a well certainly well before and after Doctor Who she's like a note she was like a fairly notable comedian mm. and she had like a sketch show and things and I was like really you got her you got her as the companion but she was pretty good she she was yeah. pretty good in that role yeah they she did proved she really has some job. acting chops yeah they uh I think they took her personality and just rolled with it because I, I don't know much about her uh, outside of Doctor Who, but uh, I just felt like she played, either she's a really good actress or she kind of, you know, leaned into the character and was like, this is kind of who I am. I can kind of do this. Don't know which, but it's mm -hmm. pretty good. Mm. What, was you, what did you think of Capaldi? Oh, I liked him. Yeah, I forgot about him. Oh, no, he was really <laughs> good. I just didn't like... Um, I didn't like the how dark that was in like in the focused on death of his like his whole run that was like I don't know it was kind of weird I don't know what they were thinking it was he interesting had, but yeah he had some very he was good his his stories weren't yeah I think that's that's the issue with him yeah and they did go re they did go weirdly dark with him now that you say it, I'm like, okay, yeah, they actually really did. Yeah, it was it was scary. <laughs> like, I mean, they, it's not like they maybe they didn't really deal with death as much in the last season. I guess they must have because it's not like, you know, uh, a kids show. But like with him, they were like really exploring it, and mm. you know, maybe maybe just it was like not what you. Uh, normally think of when you think of death it's like it's not a religious perspective it's not a very maybe scientific perspective it was kind of a mm. an out there aliens perspective mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, i don't know yeah it's yeah it it it's always been a show that's very like not bloody but um there's a, it, always a really high body count in doctor who um it, normally it's like they they vaporize them and they're gone you're like oh no but yeah that was it yeah i i don't know what it was with with capaldi there were there were those moments where it really did lean into a lot of dark stuff i remember it got complaints there was an episode they did so i so i stopped watching it i so i started watching capaldi's stuff i think his first um season that he had Mm -hmm. and i wasn't getting on with the companion at all i think it was clara yeah she was very very peppy and very she was like um kind of stealing his thunder all the time yeah. and it was starting to annoy me and then yeah. they, they did an episode where she was where like she went back in time and she stopped him being afraid of the dark or something like that it was a, it was a horrible yeah. And I yeah. went. I'm not watching this anymore because this is this is bad. Like this isn't his. This is called Doctor Who. It's not called whatever her name is. Yeah. Uh, what, yeah. What... She was like. She. I thought she was good with uh, Matt Smith. And then I wonder if, you know, when they they replace him, she's like, well, I've I've been on here the longest. I'm the important one, and uh, or something like that. It's kind of the vibe I got. Um, I didn't like her as much with Capaldi. It, it um, could be. I think they, I think the writing started to to really change. What brought yeah. me back, actually, what brought me back to the series, was this. Um, I heard that there was loads of controversy about an episode. I'm like, controversy? What controversy? There's been loads of complaints about an episode. I think it was called Dark Water, and it was one of the is one of the last ones in that season. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I. And it's the, I think it was where I've been, again, it's been a long time since I've seen it. I haven't rewatched these. 
It's the one before. It's the one where there's loads of skeletons in like yeah. water tanks. Mm -hmm. And there was a. I think it was. I remember the thing. It was don't cremate me. I think it was the thing that made people um, complain. Yeah. And because they're, they're it's like they're mm -hmm. hearing people's. They they turn on people's like dying thoughts or something. And and everyone was saying don't cremate me. Yeah, I didn't know they were. They uh, that's what they didn't like about it. Oh, I think it was that. Yeah, I think it was that. But I remember going. All right. Well, I'll see what I'll see what's going on, <laughs> because if there's controversy, it could be entertaining controversy. Yeah, it's always entertaining. Yeah. So I I went back. I started watching it again, and the next episodes were a lot better. There was a really good one on a train. Yes. Yeah. The, with the um, mummy. The Oriental Express, or was that that was the like. Uh... Yeah, that was like Murder on the Orient Express, except it wasn't like yeah, that. Yeah, there's all. a there's a mummy, mm -hmm. it's, and it appears and it kills people after a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. One, that was a good one. that was a, I remember that episode being really good, and I'm like, oh, okay, so this actually picked up. Yeah, you know what? I think I had the same experience where, like, right after that, I'm like, oh, this is pretty good again. Hmm. And then, yeah, and then, yeah, his last season was just it was not good. No. I remember, and that didn't, I, I, I just, after that, I thought, I think I'm probably done. I think I'm done with Capaldi. Like, yeah. that, this is where I'll finish. There and was then, a, one, one last episode, and it had River Song, who has been there forever, and uh, she definitely grew on me. Like, I didn't care for her too much, and then... You know, they really developed her story, mm. and I was like, okay, she was great. And they did this, uh, I think it was a Christmas special with her and him, and it was really beautiful, and it mm. kind of, like, wrapped up her story very nicely, and that was, that's the last episode I remember liking. Mm. Um, that was I good. Think, that was a good one. Yeah. Um, I tried to watch the christmas special where he regenerated i was like i'm gonna watch the whole thing and it was going on for hours i feel like or it was really <laughs> late it was long it was yeah, very it was long. long it was late and i was like you know what i know what's gonna happen i don't care and so i never finished it um was that yeah. the one where there were two masters Ooh, i don't remember i don't even remember there was one where because there was the one, I think there was the one where he got like injured before he regenerated, and then there was one where he met the first Doctor again. You, oh man, I and don't remember at all. <laughs> played by played by Filch. Okay, and, maybe that was yeah. That sounds familiar because that would have been. I was like, oh, he's from Harry Potter. I should watch that. That sounds yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And they and they made him out. They made him out to be like a doddery old man who was a bit sexist. I'm like, yeah, don't yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Um, yeah, and that was, I think that was the last one I saw, probably. And I just thought, I think I'm done. I mean, if if the next thing's getting good write ups, I might watch it, but I'm, I think Ooh. I'm done. And it just didn't get any good. Did you see any of them, um, of, the, of the lady? No, I didn't. Um, yeah, no, I didn't because. Uh, it just never worked out. You know, they, uh, I don't know, here in America, uh, they do, the BBC America does, like, all, I, maybe, is it all the Christmas specials or, like, just Doctor Who? It does a marathon of Doctor Who on Christmas, and my parents mm. have cable. Um, I don't, because I'm a millennial or whatever. <laughs> and um, uh, so we watch Doctor Who Christmas Day, and they go in order. So by the time... Uh, I think they get to that season, I'm ready to go. I'm out. So I haven't watched it. Um, yeah. I haven't seen it on any of the streaming sites I have. And so I I would. I would watch it. I'd give it a chance. Um, but eh, I'm not going to work that hard. There's a lot of other stuff out there. Mm. Yeah, I. It was. it's one of those that's... It's been going so long. And I don't want to say it's outstayed its welcome. But it's, Maybe. it may have thrown its welcome a little bit. 
maybe it needs to like go away for another couple of decades and then bring it back, <laughs> regenerate. Yeah. I mean, may maybe, yeah. I mean, it's sad to say in a way, but yeah, maybe it does. Maybe it just needs to just stop for a bit. Yeah, and it's then... still, it's really impressive that it started in the 60s and, or is it the 60s? Yeah, and yeah. it's more or less still going as, as far as um, TV shows, movies, even books. That's something, I think. That's really something. Mm. That's like, uh, you know maybe Stephen King equivalent. I don't know when he started writing, but he's got a lot of stuff out there. And um, and even then, you know, you have to be a pretty impressive author to have people keep reading just for that long. So it is, uh, it's something to think about um, as a creator, as a storyteller, that they just keep going and people just keep watching. Mm. So I don't know, I'd have to think about it, but uh, it is impressive. <laughs> If you haven't checked out Doctor Who and you keep here and you're like, why is this show sticking around? Uh, <laughs> might as well find out. Yeah, dip in. Dip into an episode or two and, uh, yeah, see how you feel. But we've, we've seamlessly, that was, I feel like that was a very nice, seamless, but very long segue into sci fi. Because you have a sci fi yeah. novel on, on Vela, you said. Yeah. So, what's um, going on with that? So that uh, is a, kind of a special, um, close to my heart story. It's the first novel I ever finished writing. Um, I finished it, yeah, not editing, writing. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I started it, it started as a short story that was kind of a, um, it was based on like some kind of dream I had. And it was, um, it was like a, what, what would you, I don't know what you call it. It was like, a, for myself I didn't write it to be special or for anything or yeah. it was just a, a story that I thought was interesting and I wrote it and funny just a funny story about that is um so I wrote it uh, right before like Thanksgiving um and I was so excited I had finished it, it was the longest piece I'd ever written this was 2011 I think hmm. or 12 or something and then the next day I uh went horseback riding and fell off the horse and got a concussion and got amnesia. And oh, God. Yeah, I kind of sort of remember what happened that day, but not a lot. And um, it, it did, some of it came back. Um, and so I was like sitting at home, kind of recovering, and I got to reread this story that I wrote for myself. And I didn't know what was going to happen. So I was like, oh, I wrote this. This is awesome. It's like, you don't get a lot of chances to do something like that. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend getting a concussion to do it. But, you <laughs> yeah. know, it happens. Don't try that at home. Yeah. If to anyone thinking about it, don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so then I just, I liked the idea and I kept writing it and I kind of came up with a, uh, a long-term story and it really, it taught me how to write a novel because I I wrote it for 10 years and there would just be periods when I was like I'm stuck I don't know what to do and I would write something and I'm like I hate this and then I ended up you know deleting multiple chapters and it's really since I wrote that I've gotten a lot better at you know knowing what to write and not having to delete as much and um so yeah, it taught me how to write a novel uh, and I finished it in, I think 2018 and then I was gonna edit it and it was a mess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought I was doing a pretty good job. The first job. one always is. Yeah, I thought I did a pretty good job and I started trying to get it published traditionally and um, a, a lovely editor, I don't remember her name, I didn't end up hiring her um, because I actually started writing The Twisted Realm. Mm. Uh, I got distracted. Uh, she basically was like, this needs serious editing. Um, she took my uh, my sample I sent her, she did a sample edit. And for some reason, uh, whatever she wrote just struck me. And I was like, I can do that. I didn't know I needed to be doing that. But now that I know, I can do it. Mm. So I actually took that and ran with it with the Twisted Realm. And I wrote that and made it way better and um and i learned so much so it actually this this novel um it taught me how to write mm. uh 
so then eventually um i was like i'm i don't really i'm not gonna pay for editing for this right now because i can't afford it and you know the problem age-old problem right and uh so I thought, well, you know what? This Vela thing is here. Um, I can do it in small chunks. And why don't I really try and put these editing skills and everything I learned from writing The Twisted Realm into the story and try and make it um, a lot better? And and that's, of course, when I realized how bad it actually is and how much, <laughs> yeah, how much uh, work it needs. So the further along I got in the process, uh, the harder it got. And so recently, um, it's just it's um it's not had as much attention from me but that's going to change um it is changing i have been working on it a bit uh but just not to the point like where i'm ready to post any more of it yet um because i know if leslie's watching this she's like hi leslie <laughs> <laughs> and uh um but yeah it's uh it's once I think I get to a point, it's like uh, it's like a, I have to rebuild some of it, or I don't know what a good analogy is, but like it'll be it's an uphill battle. And once I get to a certain point, it should be a lot easier because the the middle is kind of out there, but the ending is um, I think is pretty solid and is not going to change um, because I kind of knew what I was doing storytelling wise at that point. So <laughs> yeah. It, uh, which is odd because, you know, usually people are like, I, I can't do endings. I don't know what to do. It's like, well, they're kind of like beginnings for me. Like, I know how it's going to start. I kind of know how it's going to end. I just don't know what's going to happen in the middle. And, mm. um, it's yeah. getting there. That's the, yeah. That's the and of course, stuff in the middle could potentially change how it ends. So, yeah. Um, but it is a sci fi story that takes place, um, in a, for lack of a better word, post-apocalyptic world. Not like, um, you know, to significant, the world is so significantly changed that it's like practically unlivable, just like there was a, a big war um, that kind of just wrecked everything. And so you have this um, run, uh, partially destroyed city, but the people living in it are rebuilding. Um, they're, uh, you know, trying to bring back civilization. And I do, um, when I was writing it, I didn't want it to be like dystopian where there's crazy rules and, you know, power mad leaders. So it's actually, the people in it are kind of working together. So more or less, as well as people can. And mm. uh, the um, the villain then is the uh, these monsters um, and they're called uh, or they're called remnants. They're basically a bunch of weapons that were made for the war and now they run rampant and cause trouble and they're a mess. And um, so, you know, they're they're trying to rebuild the city and they're basically still fighting a war against these things. Um, so there's also a uh, a more, they're like, they're like animal level intelligence and then there's a human level intelligent um, remnant and uh, i won't spoil that but uh mm. basically nadia is living in the city she works in a coffee shop um because i'm a writer and coffee is you know big deal it's uh, uh writer's blood is 50 percent coffee yeah and uh but also i thought well what does a uh a city trying to rebuild what does it need besides like alcohol because i think eventually or sorry I kind of, I was going to do like bars in that, in it, and I kind of wrote it, and it didn't really work for her as a character. Like, there was one iteration where she like went to a bar, and I was like, well, I was also underage. I couldn't even go to bars when I was writing this, so <laughs> uh, I was like, you know, I'm not going to write something I don't know. Yeah. And um, so I was like, I'm going to write coffee. That's a, a drug I do know, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately. And <laughs> Yeah, um, so she works in like a coffee shop and it's like the only one and it's got good coffee unlike everywhere else. And it's um, it's a crop they can grow and roast and whatever. Uh, and it's, you know, probably more important because, you know, everybody's trying to stay alive and trying to rebuild. So it's a really popular place, um, but 
she gets in some trouble. Uh, there are the police force, um, there are enforcers, because, uh, you know, police, this is the future. No one says something that we do right now, obviously. And uh, yeah, and um, she gets in trouble with this one, of course, who is um, practically a vigilante. He's, uh, you know, he plays by his own rules and he gets away with it too. Mm. So, uh, uh, kind of, kind of, not not entirely, but yeah, people put up with him, and he's not, he doesn't seem to be subjected to the same rules as other enforcers would be, or other citizens for that matter, hmm. so um, he's dangerous to her, she's like, she's afraid of him, she's like, this guy's gonna just kill me because he can, and no one's gonna do anything about it, um, but that's not exactly it, He uh, he's actually, it turns out, um, an expert with these uh, um, remnant weapons, and he knows how to uh, to take care of them. So actually, uh, you find out later when he and uh, one of his buddies kind of showed up, um, things started getting a lot better. So uh, Nadia goes through the story. Um, some, you know, she deals with a lot of things that can just go wrong. Uh, I don't know if I want to give him away, uh, but, you know, she gets in bad situations and uh, she just finds herself around this guy. And then um, things start to get really bad. And this um, this humanoid remnant starts attacking and really causing a lot of trouble. And then Nadia gets um, all caught up in that. She gets uh, thoroughly uh, dragged into the story. I would definitely say she's a character who doesn't want to be the main character, uh, but she mm. is. So, unfortunately. I'm kind of sorry for her, but I'm the writer, so I can't be too sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's always a challenge to have a character like that and have yeah, them be sort of called to to take part in this especially if you you've got another character that is very very capable like this vigilante seems to be yeah um he he's also he's not he, he's in the story um but he's got his own problems too i will say uh he um He's not the he's not the bad guy, but he's not necessarily the good guy either. Um, so I don't know how much help he would be on his own. He might actually need Nadia, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's a fun story for me. It's cool sci-fi. It uh, I kind of explored um, you know different uh, you know different. Uh, possibilities for um for sci-fi uh stuff that could be like i created um these these weapons um kind of drawing from any sci-fi i've ever uh encountered and i was like I, I didn't i'm not i wouldn't say uh i was so bold as to try to make something new and unique um but I wanted to really try my, um, my writing skills and see what I could come up with that was, you know, somewhat different um, than stuff I read. I, wanted, I really wanted to try and not copy paste uh, in, in this story, which is a good way to learn to write, but not a great way to uh, maybe publish necessarily. I agreed. So where can people, Excuse me. Where can people find this story? So Remnants of the Experiment Wars is on Kindle Vela. Um, it has 31 episodes. Um, it's pretty simple to read a Kindle Vela story. I think you just make an account um, and you don't need, uh, it's not like Kindle, you don't need a special app or anything. You can do it on your browser. Um, the first three are free, so you get a taste. Um, and of course, if more people start reading it, I might be, uh, you know, pressured to actually slog through it and keep going. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, that's kind of how it is. It, uh, if you 
people are paying attention to something, it uh, it spurs you, I think. Um, but one way or another, uh, at some point, mm. uh, it is the rest of it is coming. So. All right. Very good. And this is for for U.S. customers only. I know you have to be a in the U.S. to post. I don't. Well, I think you have to be in the U.S. to read it as well. Mm. Yeah. So that might be just U.S. customers. But um, eventually, I will say, uh, once I finish it, I will be publishing it as a novel. So it is coming um, as a novel too. Uh, again, hopefully in the near future. I'm definitely getting. Got a lot of stuff out of the way. I'm getting back into writing uh, quite a mm. bit. So I should, I'm really excited. I should have a lot of stuff coming out, um, even some sequels to uh, The Twisted Realm as well. All right. Okay. So that will, that will, I think, will be, that will be my last question, I think, circling back to The Twisted Realm. Nice segue there. All right. So circling back to that, how many are there going to be, do you think? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, so the first three are one story arc. So that um, it's sort of a trilogy. And I wanted to write basically three trilogies. So there could be nine books. Um, there could be more. Um, or I might just condense stories into full length novels. So I was, I'm writing novellas because it's, um, it's more doable as a, in my opinion as a um you know if you have to pay for editing and stuff financially mm. it's more doable to publish novellas um for me at least not everyone uh and so i have kind of toyed with the idea of maybe just writing the sequels as full novels full-length novels so uh either way there's either going to be three no or six more novellas or hopefully two novels or maybe a combination of that so but mm -hmm. it's uh it's coming <laughs> all sense. right okay good stuff and they of course they of course can be found here if you're if you're an american you can um you can also find this kindle vela story remnants of the what was it? Rem wars. Yep. remnant yep. remnants of the experiment wars all right okay and here we are all right so <clears throat> um where can people find you uh i am on mines um Amy is great 20, I think, or is, maybe it's just Amy is great. You know, uh, keep it simple so you remember. I'm not saying I'm great, but I might but, be. But mine says that, so it must be true. Yes. <laughs> um, mine says that, yeah. Um, and then Instagram, uh, Twisted Realm Writing. Mm -hmm. All right, brilliant. Okay, well, I mean, you can find me, obviously, at this YouTube channel. Thank you for subbing and watching. Uh, you can find me at Matt Waterhouse Author on Minds, and you can find me um, on Instagram. I sometimes remember to, to say that, and sometimes I forget, and I don't ask me what my Instagram name is, because I can never remember that. Um, but you can also find me on Substack, which is uh, somewhere. Oh, well, you can find these, obviously, of course, on uh, on Amazon and on the Kindle, paperback and ebook, which is the the lit the growing freaking library of stuff and substack gear mattwaterhouse.substack.com we've got short stories um we have novel extracts and um, there's a new thing potentially here which is uh well, let's say potentially it is a new thing which is the shattered lands um don't know if that's going to be entirely on substack or if it's going to appear at some point in book form we'll i'm sort of playing that by ear and also there are some um, travel writing that hasn't started yet because i'm not there yet all right so amy thank you for coming on it's been a yeah. it's been a fun chat i always like talking about doctor who yeah thanks for having me this has been fun all right fantastic well uh i'll see you all next time yeah